Pilate washed his hands, declared himself innocent of shedding the blood of Christ and condemned Jesus to death. Jesus is alone. The crowds that follow him during his public ministry and acclaim him Hosanna when he entered Jerusalem have changed their praises into cries of condemnation. Crucify him. Jesus is condemned to death for loving, for loving as sinners, for being loved. Thank you, Jesus, because for love of us, you accepted the condemnation to death that we deserve for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much. With what great love Jesus embraces the cross that is going to kill him. That heavy cross are the sins of the entire humanity. Our sins, mine and yours. How heavy is the cross, but how light becomes when it is embraced by Christ for love of us. Thank you, Jesus, for carrying upon your shoulders the cross of the entire humanity. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the weight of my sins in the cross that you carry on your back. Thank you, because thanks to you, the yoke of our sins is easy and its burden is light.
The King of Kings has fallen to the ground. You, Lord, creator of infinite heights, now have your face pressed against the gravel of a dusty road. You, who are co-equal with God, did not hold tight to that equality, but rather you emptied yourself to take our form. But taking the form of a slave was not enough. You accepted that cross that is now pinning your face to the filthy ground. You are so exalted that angels would bear you up on their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone are now pressed against that stone. You can go no lower now. The cross is digging the thorns on your head deeper into your skull. Your blood is painting your face on the earth beneath you. You, in whom everything has come to be and holds together, why can't you get up? Why is this cross so heavy for you? It's not the wood, is it? No, that you could lift with no effort. It's my sin that you nail to that wood that makes it heavy. I'm pressing you down, and you love me so much that you won't push me off. No, even more. You invite me to pile all my sins on your cross. Now it's time to get on. You get up, and you lift me up. Now my cross is small, and it's light. Your blood trail and the groove plowed by your heavy cross show me the way to your Golgotha, to my Golgotha. Lord Jesus, help me carry my cross and walk beside you. Even through the blood and sweat in your eyes, Lord Jesus, you recognize that face, the face of your mother. You know that voice that serenaded you for nine months in her womb and mothered you for 33 years. You know that unmistakable, unique smell that every child knows his mother by. But it's her eyes that you peer into. Those eyes that look onto you with the love of a birthing mother. Now you want to console her. Tell her how much you love her. Tell her not to worry about you. Remind her how you have to return to your father's house. It's just that there is still this one final act of love that will shatter death and sin forever. Her eyes tell you that she understands that this encounter with you is different than the first one when she held you right after you left her womb. Then she had charge of you. Now you are the one pointing her in a new direction, toward a new horizon, an amazing heaven. But the road must go to the cross first. She understands that. She believes that, so she won't cling to you. She's letting her baby son go, and she's walking right behind you. Mother Mary, sustain us by your prayers as we walk behind Jesus, as you did, as we stand at the foot of his cross, as you did, as we trust in him, just as you did. Have you ever asked this question, does God hear me? Can God hear my prayer? Just before station number five, Jesus met his mother as he carried his cross. That was station number four. The Bible does not mention this meeting, but the, the tradition of the church does consider this moment of sorrow between Jesus and Mary on Good Friday. It is possible that no words were spoken out loud. 
Jesus looked at her. She looked at Jesus. Our Lady of Sorrows was looking deeply into the eyes of Jesus, truly the Man of Sorrows. Together they suffered on that road in Jerusalem. The two hearts were joined as one at that moment. In her immaculate heart, Mary prayed. She cried out to God, and God heard her prayer. Like an arrow, her prayer went straight up to heaven. In her heart, she cried out, Won't somebody please help my son Jesus to carry his heavy cross? Her silent prayer was heard by God. At first, Simon of Cyrene was pushed into service by the Roman soldiers. He was drafted. But something happened. A change occurred. With God's grace, Simon, Saint Simon of Cyrene began to help Jesus to carry that heavy cross the rest of the way. St. John Henry Cardinal Newman composed a meditation on the last hours in the life of Jesus on Good Friday. Part of his meditation was to focus on the silent prayer of Our Lady. Station number four and station number five are intimately connected. When St. Simon of Cyrene helped Jesus, St. Simon was helping Mary. St. Simon of Cyrene was an answer to her desperate prayer. Suffering is all around us. Just look around. When we step in to help someone who is suffering, we can become an answer to someone's prayer. We begin to suffer with them. Compassion means to suffer with someone. Our Lady of Sorrows, the Blessed Mother, wants us to help each other to carry her son's heavy cross. As we approach Easter, do what you can. At times, it will be extremely difficult. God does indeed hear our prayers. God wants us to ste step in and help. God wants us to pray and he wants us to help. Like St. Simon of Cyrene, you too have been drafted by Jesus and his mother. Our Lady of Sorrows wants us to help to carry the cross of her son, Jesus Christ. Our Lady of Sorrows does not want Jesus alone to carry that heavy cross. Her prayer is a mother's prayer begging us to help Jesus and her many desperate children. One instruction in today's virus crisis says, whatever you do, do not touch your face. Do not touch your face. Perhaps this is the most difficult instruction for our mothers. Why? Well, perhaps the first thing your mother did on the day you were born was to touch your face. It is second nature for your mother to touch your face. By the time you began first grade, your mother had wiped your face at least a million times. Just before station number six, Jesus met his mother as he carried his cross. That was station number four. His mother looked at his most beautiful face, that holy face. Now it was covered in his most precious blood. As he carried the heavy cross, Jesus fell. The cross pushed his face into the dirt. The crown of thorns made the head of Jesus bleed and bleed. That blood on his head washed down. His face was covered in his blood, in his eyes, and over his nose. The blood was then mixed with sand on the road. Each time, Jesus fell under the cross. 
Along the way, so many men spat in the face of Jesus. And Jesus was sweating. That sweat combined with the sand and the blood and the spittle covered the holy face of Jesus. When Jesus met his mother in station number four, she prayed in her heart something like this. Won't somebody please wipe his face? In station number six, St. Veronica came forward with a towel. She wiped the face of Jesus. This was an answer to the Virgin Mary's prayer. Instead of the towel being soiled, the holy face of Jesus was now imprinted on the towel. When you help your neighbor, when you help even strangers like St. Veronica, your gift is immediately recognized by Jesus. Jesus tells us in the Bible, whatever you did for the least of my brothers, you did in fact for me. The holy face of Jesus is here in the world today. When you help someone in need, someone who cannot help themselves, you do it to help that person and you do it for Jesus. When you help someone in need because you love Jesus, you will never go unpaid. You will never go without your gift from Jesus. St. Veronica was, a, was given a tremendous gift she was given the holy face on the towel which she used to wipe the holy face of Jesus. Let station number six remind us that before we die, we can wipe the face of Jesus like St. Veronica. When St. Veronica wiped the face of Jesus, it was an answer to a mother's prayer that someone would please wipe the most holy face of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. After the exhausting and painful and lingering effects of the first fall, Jesus falls down again. It's a sign of his increasingly weak condition as he carries the cross. And it's a sign that Jesus truly has become a human being in his incarnation. And suffering, debilitating weakness, and pain follow him and increase as he increasingly gets tired on his way to Calvary. It's a sign of the ongoing weakness of the human condition. Many people get frustrated with themselves after going to confession and they fall again a second time, sometimes or oftentimes for the same thing, the same sin. Today, Jesus's second fall reminds us that we very much are weak creatures and we very much depend on God as we journey through this life on the road with Jesus to Calvary.
daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. For if they do these things to the green wood, what shall be done to the dry? Luke chapter 23. Jesus tells the women of Jerusalem who weep for him that if this suffering is what, what happens to the perfect man, then all of us who are sinners need especially to pray for our own journeys to Calvary. Focus on our way of the cross and the journey of those God has entrusted to us. Jesus directs our attention to ours and others' journey on our own path through this veil of tears. Life is not easy. Life on earth is not heaven. Life for all of us is the way of the cross. And Jesus teaches us and the women of Jerusalem to remember to focus our energies on walking with him rather than trying to stay here and make heaven out of earth. Jesus' third fall is a fall that approaches utter and complete and total weakness. There is nothing left in the system. Jesus is physically broken. His previous falls, the weight of the cross, the suffering of the tortures, and the pain of the crown of thorns have left him with no strength of his own. Jesus is almost completely broken by suffering. Our repeated falls into sin remind us of Jesus' multiple falls on the way of the cross. When we fall into habits and patterns of sin, we become tempted to despair. We become tempted to walk away. We become tempted to give up our journey and Calvary. But Jesus' progression gives us hope. We recognize in Jesus our own complete lack of strength. And instead of giving up, God invites us with the Lord to completely entrust ourselves to him and acknowledging our weakness and our lack of strength. Having reached the place of his execution, Jesus suffers greatly as he is violently stripped of his clothes. Flesh stuck to his inner garments with dried blood is torn from his body. Jesus suffers additional humiliation being left naked for all to see. With the whole world suffering the effects of the pandemic, we too are stripped and humiliated. We have been stripped of our jobs, we have been stripped of the daily connection with our closest friends and family. Our humiliation is the realization that the veil of control we thought we had is truly an illusion. However, take heart. We know we are one body, and what affects each of us affects all of us. Being stripped of all we hold on to allows us to reorder what is truly important. As Jesus rightly tells us, we are to love God first above all else and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. As Christ arrives on the Mount of Skulls, we reflect on his horrible passion that brought him here. Following his humiliating experience before Pilate, he endured an incredible beating with whips with sharp hooks that took a small piece of flesh out of a different part of his body with each stroke. Then the crown of thorns was pressed onto his head that pierced his skull and tormented his head with every movement. And then carrying his heavy cross, dragging it upon the long road to Calvary, caused excruciating pain that Christ bravely endured. And then Jesus is thrown to the cross on the ground and had spikes hammered through his hands and feet 
that were in terrible pain and bloody before the thick nails were bent over to hold him in place. Jesus completely surrendered any human desire to protect himself and then hung on the cross for long and painful hours before death finally came to him. Our Savior experienced incredible torture and pain for us as restitution for our sins. Not his sins, he had none. But he did it for you and me because he loves us so much. He doesn't expect us to respond to his love in a like manner, but he asks us to love him, follow his teachings, and to love one another.
Jesus was unjustly tortured and killed. He was the victim of a gruesome assassination. But instead of responding with anger, he gave us another example that we should follow. As he hung upon the cross, darkness fell over the entire land and the earth shook and people throughout Jerusalem were frightened. He asked his Almighty Father to forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus endured the horrors of terror, humiliation, and pain without complaints, because he knew it was his Father's plan for him to provide for our salvation. Our Heavenly Father has a plan for each one of us as well. When our Father sees that we have completed all that he has planned for us to do, and the light of our life is dimming, it would be well to remember and repeat the last seven words Jesus said from the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Consider that after our Lord had died, two of his disciples, Joseph and Nicodemus, took him down from the cross and placed him in the waiting arms of his afflicted mother. She received him with unspeakable tenderness and pressed him close to her heart. Nothing can destroy the work of God the dead body of our Lord is still a sacred body. The work of salvation continues. As we profess in the creed, he descended into hell. A new vision of fortitude comes to birth in the world. The courage of the Christian martyrs enables them to die rather than deny what is held by the Catholic and divine faith. Martyrs of yesteryear and of today exhibit the Holy Spirit's gift of fortitude in its most exquisite form. By their own courageous deaths, they remind us of the true hierarchy of values in life. God is worth a life. Others who do not receive the gift of martyrdom must still imitate the spiritual fortitude of the martyrs. Heavenly Father, your son's body was laid in the arms of his sorrowing mother to teach us not to dread natural death. Grant me the gift of fortitude, so that I may not shrink from the difficulties that my Christian vocation imposes, and may find comfort at last in the arms of my mother, Mary. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Consider the disciples carrying the body of Jesus to the place of burial. After his holy mother arranges his body in the tomb with her own hands, they pull back the stone and depart. The garden tomb is the place where the disciples of Jesus place the dead body of Jesus. We enter into the mystery of the Triduum, the three days when Christ's body remains buried in the earth. The silence of these days prepares us for a life of Christian recollection. The virtue of temperance governs the right use of those good things that are required to sustain human nature. Christian temperance ensures that our pleasures remain proportionate to the good they accompany. The mysteries of Christ's life, death, and resurrection appear more brightly to the one who is not unduly distracted even by the necessities of life. Heavenly Father, the burial of Christ transforms every earthly sepulchre into a place of waiting and expectation. Grant me the grace to prepare for a happy death, so that having been buried once with Christ in baptism, I may expect to receive from you the gift of everlasting life. 